again, anything I talked to you about today, please don't hesitate to reach out. Gmail tends to work the best. I try to get back to people within 24 hours if I get a message on Gmail. If you're on Twitter, it's just at thirk. Uh, any of the other social media platforms, just first name, last name, and you should be able to link up with me. So tell me if it doesn't feel a little bit like this, right? And, and sometimes May is even harder uh, for those of us, particularly in Canada and the United States, as the school year starts to uh, come to a, a conclusion. Uh, I do not have ducks. I do not have a row. I have squirrels and they're at a rave. Right? This inability right now over this last number of years to control the situation. Uh, many of us, if not all of us, are in roles where having a sense of control has been important. It's been important if you have any connection to the education scene. It's important in your role as parents. It's important in the role of community members. Um, so this, this inability right now uh, to, to be able to just hold on to anything. Look, the time of the pandemic, I can tell you hands down, the most challenging time I've ever experienced as an educator. Right? Uh, I think we haven't finished yet. I know it's uh, all well and good for the World Health Organization to declare that the pandemic is over. I'm still seeing the impact as I travel. I uh, just came from a three-week tour of Australia. Um, pretty much every school I worked in over there had staff members that were away due to being diagnosed with COVID. And so I don't think we're past. I also know that we have to take advantage of the learning opportunities provided. Because what I am not prepared to do, despite at times feeling like both these characters, you know, there were moments where I was just dragging myself around like old Eeyore, right? Only seeing the dark side of everything. The woe is me. And listen, there were lots of things to be upset about. And then there were other days where I was like the Energizer Bunny, just go, 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 right? How many of you became gardeners and bread makers and you had this newfound energy? And then you sort of crashed a little bit. And so you went back and forth. The reality is we're probably somewhere in between those two. But what I'm not prepared to do is to take advantage of the situation. I'm not looking for the convenience of the negative. I will not be a COVID apologist, nor will I be a COVID excuse maker as far as I can, for as long as I can, in the world of education. Right? I happen to believe that it's had impact but I disagree on where that impact is being felt. There were a lot of people who made a lot of money and are still doing so around this notion that an academic gap was created during the pandemic. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe the gap that was created is a gap on the social emotional learning front, a gap on getting along, a gap on relationship, a gap on, and we got exposed on this one, in our response to trauma, right? We've got 13 years. That's a 13 year experience we call school. It's not 13 10 month experiences. It's a 13 year experience we call school. And in that 13 years, I believe we can close every academic gap. I believe we can close the social emotional learning gap, but we have to want to. There isn't a school I'm working with today that has not indicated to me that they have seen a spike in office referrals, a spike in negative behaviors, a spike in the ability for people to connect with others. And that spike is not just limited to our students. The adults are also struggling with how to get along. That's the impact I believe that we've got to be addressing. So while our focus this evening is on trauma and the impact of trauma, I think it's much more far reaching than that. Let me be clear. Trauma did not arrive with the pandemic. It was exacerbated by the pandemic, certainly more influenced by the pandemic. Trauma won't depart post pandemic. We know this is going on for many of our students in many different ways. We know what's going on for many of our adults. The inability during that time of the pandemic to connect with others really made it a challenge. But let's be clear, we're not going back. Right? People keep talking about, oh, I can't wait to get back to the old normal. The world we left 
does not exist anymore. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of this notion of going forward to a new normal, because for me, normal still has some constraints, some boundaries. I prefer to think about us going forward to the new better. What have we learned added to the brilliance of what we knew before? And let's fashion that new better. We can fashion that in our schools, in our homes, in our districts, in our communities. But we must be intentional in our desire to fashion that new better. This is a mistaken notion that simply reopening was going to cause everything to get back to whatever the back to was. That opening the doors of schools would mean that everyone would equally embrace coming back. That opening all of our communities would just have everybody slot back into. Right? There was some learning. There was some separation that happened during the hardest moments of the pandemic. And those need to be, the skills need to be retaught. Look, if, if you were just home with your sibling for a period of time, you probably could get away with some stuff that might not be positive in other public situations. Right? Now we're back. Now we need to reteach. We need to rebuild. I'm fond of suggesting this notion that when kids come to school, for example, they're coming to our house. It's the only house over which we have any control. It's the only house over which we can influence. I have no sway in the other house they live in. So I'm going to stop lamenting that. I'm going to focus on what happens in our house. Well, in our house, we need to rebuild our family. Right? We need to reconnect people, kids and adults. Kids to kids, kids to adults, adults to adults. So I'm going to talk a lot about the content of the book that you see featured there, Trauma Sensitive Instruction. And again, if that's something you're interested in getting a hold of, you'll just shoot me a message afterwards and we'll figure out how we can make that happen for you. Right? But John Eller and I start this book off with this definition. Because we found this definition to be incredibly powerful. It kind of shook us both when we thought about what does this mean? The reason why John and I wrote this book, and we wrote it, by the way, we started crafting it long before the pandemic was a word that rolled off our lips so frequently, long before Zoom became part of our vernacular. Right? But this definition really took us. When you use words like exceptional and powerful and dangerous and overwhelm, it's a reminder. Right? It's a reminder that we're not dealing with something that's just got light impact, that it has significant impact, far reaching impact. And it's going to take, again, intentionality to foster an environment where we can be more trauma sensitive, more trauma aware. What I'm going to talk with you about here today isn't, by the way, just geared at those that we perceive to be struggling with trauma. Let's collect, correct a couple of things, first of all. I don't know, and this isn't meant to be a challenge to anybody, but I don't know that any of us could rapidly and accurately identify in a classroom of 30 which five or six kids were experiencing complex trauma. That's what the research says, right? That, that many kids in each classroom. I don't think it's obvious. I also know we have an inability to predict which kids will experience trauma later on. Look, this thing called life, there is a certainty that all of us will go through hard moments. Everybody gathered here today, all of the students, anybody in your communities, we are all going to be handed some challenging times in this thing called life. So when we talk about being trauma sensitive and trauma aware, it's not just dealing with the current. It's preparing for what's coming. Okay. So trauma sensitive, what might be traumatic to me could be less so to you. Right? As our friend Sowers and Hall talked about, it's our own interpretations 
that influence the degree of impact we feel. So what might be traumatic to me might be less so to you. That doesn't reduce the trauma I'm experiencing. Many of you will be aware that in Canada, we're going through this truth and reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. Okay. As a result, largely of the residential school experience and the range of experiences runs that full continuum. But no one's impact should be minimized by comparison. Okay. My wife cannot watch a movie where there are people shot. She just can't. It just scares her too, too much for her to be comfortable watching. Our oldest granddaughter thinks those might be the greatest movies ever. And she replied to my wife recently, you know, Grandma, nobody really gets shot. They're all just actors. It doesn't matter. The impact of trauma is very unique. Look, I'm sure many of you, you know, going back, now you have to be of a certain vintage to remember this. But in the Bambi movie, Bambi's mother got shot. For some, that was quite traumatic. Listen, if I just tell you that she didn't really get shot, they only stopped drawing her, that might not reduce the impact of the trauma you felt. Okay? So our own interpretations really do impact. You have all had a singularly unique life to get to this point. That influences how you respond. And that's before we consider your genetic makeup. Because our genetic makeup makes us sometimes predisposed to experiencing things in a different light or with a different set of lenses. Okay. I love what Van der Kolk says, though. She says, trauma comes back as a reaction not a memory. It's not so much that I'm cognitively aware as sometimes it's a situation or a moment that triggers that memory. It's a smell, it's a sound, it's a musical chord that all of a sudden right, triggers that reaction. So as we start off in the book, we talked about the adverse childhood experiences, A-C-E a landmark study that really got the conversation furthered around trauma and the impact. What happens in the brain? What happens when we react certain ways? So the original ACEs study was done in the late 1990s. It was a collaboration between the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, and Kaiser Permanente. What did they find? Not surprising, in retrospect, when we look back on that, we wonder, gee, why was anybody surprised? Adverse events in childhood impacted the health in adults. We know this. We know this in our schools. We know this in our communities. We know this in all the service provider centers like Pine River Institute, where the impact is such that. Right? But it really did cause a much greater focus on what's happening when we experience adverse childhood events. What did the study reveal? 17,000 middle-class Americans, largely white middle-class Americans, 25% reported they experienced more than one of these adverse childhood experiences, right? 10 questions, many of you will be familiar with it. You can check that out online as well. One in 16 experienced four or more. Now, the more ACEs, the more negative impacts on every aspect of your life, from health all the way through. Okay. Follow-up studies. And again, I apologize. Uh, we've got lots of studies, but I wanted to make sure that you understood the impact here. Nearly 35 million U.S. children have experienced at least one type of childhood trauma. Children as young as two to five at least one severe stressor. Now, remember, that's not for me to decide, right? The impact is different. Uh, just prior to uh, us starting up, we had uh, one of our colleagues ask about, because he's got a student who's just come in from another country, new student in a kindergarten class. Does changing countries produce trauma? The short answer, yes. Does it produce trauma guaranteed in every kid that makes that journey? No, but that's not relevant. What's relevant is this child is going through 
we know that, you know, if I think about Canada in particular, we have taken a lot of people in from war-torn countries, from refugee camps. We are taking in kids who have seen things that no child ought to see. Yes, there's trauma going on. Okay. Look at that last bullet. More than half the students enrolled in public schools have faced traumatic or adverse experiences. More than half. And one in six struggles with complex trauma. So let me go back to my earlier premise. In a classroom of 30 kids, do you believe you could accurately pick out the five or so that are experiencing complex trauma? I don't believe that's the case. I believe our response to trauma generally has been much, much more situational, much more topical than practical. And I say that knowing that we are doing this with a big heart. We hear that a student has lost their grandparent and we, the team, rally around that student for a period of time. But it's short-lived. It's well-meaning, well-intentioned. But we've got a lot of kids for whom the trauma is not evident. It would be much easier if it was always accompanied by outrageous behavior. But oftentimes it's not. What do we need to know really when it comes to the brain? And we tried not to get into too heavily into the brain research aspects of things. But here's basically what happens. Whatever the fear-inducing, trauma-inducing event is, it activates the amygdala in the brain. The amygdala stimulates the release of cortisol. Once cortisol is in the body, all learning stops. Let me say that again. Once cortisol is in the body, all learning stops. It has very little to do with how awesome you are when you greet a child, when you greet a colleague. If they have experienced trauma that morning, prior to their encounter with you, they are not able to learn. They are not able to regulate emotion. It takes the body two to three hours to metabolize. After about 20 minutes or so, generally, people are much more regulated and able to participate. It doesn't mean you've got to ignore folks for two to three hours but it does take time. Now, here is the positive news on this front. Relationship, the power of relationship, of connection, serves to calm the amygdala. Strong, healthy, caring relationships serve to calm the amygdala. A calm amygdala does not as quickly release the cortisol. Do you see now why perhaps during the worst time of the pandemic when relationships were fractured and it was difficult to establish, maintain relationships that we saw more and more dysregulated behaviors and how we must be intentional in our return to school, in our return to community to build those again. They aren't going to happen naturally. So what happens again? The amygdala sends the alert. First thing that happens, stress hormones flood the body. The immune system gets suppressed. When you are stressed, you are more prone to pick up every bug floating around. Heart rate, blood pressure increase, blood flows to the muscles. We just feel ourselves getting tense. The digestive system shuts down. It wants to save energy. The spinal cord again sends that alert. We tense up. We get really anxious. Hammond talks about, though, when children experience trauma, and by the way, it's not a whole lot different with adults, their brain says what they should do. Some might engage the fight. Sometimes it is obvious with the very overt behavior. But some choose the flight. We've lost kids. We have kids go away for a period of time. Right? Some choose the hide, walking around with a big grin on their face all the time or the appease, or the freeze, right? 
So it's not always obvious who's experiencing it and when. In one of the other books I wrote called Manage Unstoppable Learning, I talk about this that I think ought to be the desire of every school. I think of every community organization, of every place that is open to the public. The optimal environment that will allow everyone to experience success, regardless of their status, their approach, their baggage, their disposition. Right? That we make the commitment to organizing a physical space that cultivates a supportive, positive, emotional space. Do you have places in your schools, in your community centers that are calming spaces? A place where I can go just to manage myself, maybe to self-regulate a little bit before I'm entering. I just came from a community I was doing some work in and a small community, small school, 50 kids. But most of them are going through very difficult situations at home. And the team at the school has realized that the first hour, particularly on a Monday morning, is about relationship building, reconnecting. That those kids need that time to ground rather than to rush into the learning, rather than to be hit with a test, an assessment, something. Okay, so are we prepared to create that optimal learning environment? I want to show you this, uh, this clip. It's again a reminder of all the opportunities we have. I want you to just maybe make a couple of notes to yourself about what resonates with you as you see this. And we can come back to those during the Q&A time. What does it mean to, to make the world a better place? So those are those big questions we're focusing on. For me, being trauma-informed has so much to do with mindset. Accepting that different people come into a school setting with incredibly varied life experiences. Some of those life experiences may be traumatic. And the way in which that plays out in my particular classroom could look a number of ways. And by me having that lens, it makes it less about are they doing the right thing or the wrong thing and more about where is that behavior coming from? Why is that happening? Adverse childhood experiences like poverty, neglect, exposure to violence can bring about overwhelming stress, which can cause negative effects on the learning brain and on behavior. If children have the experience of adversity, they will have uneven development of these foundational skills like self-regulation and executive function or relationship skills. These are the children who are at risk to fall further and further behind. But the good news is that there is a powerful antidote to stress, and that is the effect of the human relationship and the presence of trust. Schools are an ideal place to produce many different kinds of relationships that are capable of buffering stress. Schools themselves can be healing places if you're fearful, if you're anxious, if you're distracted about something that's happened to you, you literally can't learn. Your brain shuts down. So it's essential to give kids social and emotional tools that allow students to recover from the challenges that they have experienced. Take actual classroom time to work on the building blocks of how to perceive your emotions, how to talk about them, how to get along with other people, how to take a moment and become calm when you need to, how to express your needs so that others can meet them. When we start to understand what it takes to be responsive to the effects of trauma, we need to think about the environment, about individual services, and we need to think about the skills and mindsets of kids that won't develop as they should when they're impacted by trauma. I do a lot of work around self-awareness and being able to name emotions and then make a choice around those. 
I get mad, I take deep breaths, and that helps me get more calm. Mm -hmm. Many of the things that we think about doing for kids who may have experienced trauma are good for everybody. And everyone will encounter some kind of adverse circumstance at some point in their life. And for some children, we're helping them deal with what's already happened in their lives. For others, we're preparing them to deal with the challenges later in their lives. If you can hear my voice today, awesome. <laughs> Again, as you think about some of the key messages there, right? uh, I love what Darling Hammond says. It's not about whether we're going through it currently. It's about preparing for the potential of it. I love what Cantor says about how schools in particular are designed as institutions where healthy relationship building should be part of everything we do. And so again, are we taking up the charge? Are we interested in being intentional as we work to get through and arm our kids with the skills necessary to build out their trauma awareness, trauma sensitivity. Right? So what does it look like? And this is true of any organization. What does progress look like? Well, we start off on that uh, trauma reactive side. It's fragmented. Now, trauma reactive doesn't mean that we don't do anything, but it's like I said, it's very much a situational approach. We hear something or we witness something and we think that that is the only and always indicator of trauma. So we're fragmented, we're reactive. We really haven't built a safety net. As a result, we often get overwhelmed when things happen because we're not ready for those things to happen. Now, listen, to be fair, sometimes we can't be ready you know, in January of 2020, we were not preparing for the pandemic that was going to hit shortly thereafter, right? Are we fear-driven? We're rigid. We're numb. As we become more trauma-informed, we resist the notion of re-traumatizing. We recognize that there are sociocultural impacts, as we even saw during the pandemic, during the responses to the pandemic. We start to become aware that there's more stuff going on that could be trauma triggers. We realize the widespread impact. We recognize what effect it is having, and we respond by changing our practice. As we become a healing organization, all of this work is integrated. We are reflective. We're collaborative. We don't get overwhelmed. We're relationship-centered. We are really focused on prevention and we're equitable and inclusive, right? So as we move from trauma inducing to trauma reducing, it's about thinking about your next first steps. Where are you now on the journey? What do you need to add? As we talk about in the book, there's really some key areas. Attitude, mindset is important. Our traditional response to behavior is important. And what we do to stay calm and focused when we are confronted with some serious emotional outbursts, right? I love this quote, and this is a quote from Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck's might, name might sound familiar to you. Carol Dweck is the person who has spent a lot of time talking about fixed and growth mindsets, right? So fixed and growth mindsets, this notion that sometimes we are um, in, in a, bit of a belief that things are the way they are and this is the way it's going to be forever versus the opportunity to change that the current position we find ourselves in is not the determiner of the end point it's just the determiner of the starting point okay so what do you believe about you do you believe you can be a difference maker then that's what you will be you will indeed be a difference maker it profoundly affects the way you lead your life. What do you believe about you and your capacity? So again, do you model? Here's what it comes down to for me, really quite simply. If you don't model what you expect, you should expect what you model. The eyes are on you always, but it is about being authentically you. If you are the good morning person, please keep doing that because that's authentically you. 
if you're not the good morning person, please don't force it. It looks kind of creepy. You get that fake grin on. Hey, everybody, so happy to your face starts to hurt because it's so unnatural. Here's what I've discovered over 40 years as an educator. Kids have no problem with you being you. They have a great deal of problem with you trying to be somebody you're not. I've been in some environments that I would describe as incredibly rigid, but I go into that room and I talk to kids and they love the person at the front of the room. They have no difficulty understanding the expectations could shift, right? So you have to be thinking about why you're doing what you're doing. Is it to reveal yourself or is it because you have an expectation of something, right? Look, kids who have gone through trauma, oftentimes there's been a lot of emotion involved. Oftentimes they've encountered adults who appear to be nice. But they are appearing to be nice as a precursor to an adult need. Right? This isn't adults showing themselves. This is adults expecting something. Right? So again, are you authentically you? Great. If this isn't you, don't be a poor version of somebody else. We also know this. Our reactions are crucial. Right? Most times when people have gone through trauma, there's been some emotion already. You are not going to calm down someone emotionally by getting more emotional. If you're built on a foundation of respect, then the time to most demonstrate it is when the person you are with are being disrespectful. I am not saying tolerate, but you will never teach a child about respect by out disrespecting them. All you will be teaching them is about power. They will recognize that when they get to be bigger or older, they too can be disrespectful. Right? Again, not easy, but we know this. When emotions are already heightened, they hardly get to see the value of being calm, of being able to process a situation. How do we change that reaction? It all depends on how we view that. Right? So instead of saying what's wrong, we might want to focus on what happened. Instead of taking a side, we may want to gather evidence. We may also want to be thinking, how much do we know about the individual involved here? What do we know about that individual's strengths, their assets? How do we leverage growth in a situation like this? Right? The more we know, the more we can find out about our kids, about our colleagues, the more that becomes, how do we leverage? When we are trying to get people to change a behavior, it doesn't just happen the first time you say, hey, you should change that behavior. And here's 17 pieces of research that tell you what that's not going to do it. It was a study that came out of the University College of London a few years back. And it talked about how long it takes to establish a new habit. And the range was 18 to 254 days. As I work with schools in particular, I suggest to most schools they're very likely to have 254 day kid. 254 day kids not lighting up the first time an adult is nice to them. They've seen niceness before. Again, oftentimes as a precursor to an adult need. They've been through a lot. They're going to check your sincerity. It's going to take some time. It's going to maybe take some stumbles. They might not get it right the first time. But you need to be there in that supportive role. The more I know about your strengths, your assets, the more things I can leverage and remind you that you can indeed grow, that the current circumstances do not determine the end point. They just determine the starting point. I also love this quote from Macri Botsari. Thinking about kids at school, she says, you know, students who felt unconditionally accepted by their teachers were more likely to be interested in learning. They're more likely to enjoy school, the work of it. School becomes a 13-year opportunity in that situation, not a 13-year sentence. Right? 
kids start to look at. So I need you to think about that. Is everybody in your school, those of you joining from other organizations, would you say everybody feels unconditionally accepted for who they are? One of the things I ask schools to do is this. Would you say that every kid is known by name and by need? If you were to put a picture up of every kid on the wall and you give every adult sticky dots, would every kid get a sticky dot? I don't need you to do this so you can create a woe is me moment or to beat up on yourselves. I have had very few schools that I've worked with over the last decade that would answer this question in the positive. Now the question becomes, what are you prepared to do? If you have some kids that are not connected, not known, what are you prepared to do in your learning organization? I grew up in a time where resilience was aligned with grit. It existed only in certain epic, heroic characters we all wanted to be like, but we knew we couldn't, so we just admired. Turns out we were wrong. I love what the American Psychological Association says. Process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. In other words, it can be taught. We can build this. It'll help to keep stress at a tolerable level. It is not grit. It is not just for some. I love the picture that I put there to the left. Those are chives. They are growing in the cracks between the paving stones. That is not where we planted the chives. We planted the chives in the planter, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. They grew really well, sort of. But when the flower heads came out, the purple flowers, my granddaughter, Ren, thought they might be tasty. So she popped all the flower heads off, put them in her mouth, discovered very quickly that that was a very sharp taste, and spit them all out. She spit them. They landed in the cracks. The chives in the cracks are growing better than the chives in the fertilized planter container. So I've discovered the key to growing good chives is to have a five-year-old chew up flower heads and spit them out, right? The process of adapting well. Let me show you a little clip, two minutes on resilience. Resilience is the result of a highly interactive process between individual characteristics and the person and the environment in which that individual has developed. It's really the counterbalancing of difficult things that may exist in the child's life with positive things that occur within the family, but even positive things that may exist in the community. The easy way of thinking about resilience is like a, a scale um, with a fulcrum in the, in the middle of it. And there are things on both sides of that scale experiences of both bad things or good things. Our genes shape where the fulcrum is positioned at the start. There are certain genes that make a child more sensitive to the effects of maltreatment or parental neglect or witnessing violence. The fulcrum may start out kind of more towards one side or more towards the other side, and that's going to make a big difference in terms of how much these subsequent events affect things positively or negatively. Science tells us that experience moves the fulcrum for better or for worse. Even though we are born with genes, genes will respond differently to certain environmental situations as opposed to others. What the genes are actually doing are turning up or turning down the expression of chemicals in circuits in the brain and the circuitry in the entire body that, that govern our responses to stress, to anxiety, to depressive symptoms. When positive experiences accumulate and children learn coping skills that help them to manage stress, the fulcrum can slide so the scale tilts toward positive outcomes more easily. That's what resilience is all about. There's always an adult or more than one adult who is key to providing that relationship that helps to build resilience.
And again, as we think about the impact and our abilities, you know, what's evident from that clip is this, you can't change the genetic makeup of your kids, of your colleagues. And as you saw, sometimes that genetic, genetic makeup might make us more prone to responding in a certain way. What we can do though, is arm kids, arm colleagues with the coping skills and strategies and set up more positive than negative possibilities. And that will shift that fulcrum. I love what Barbara Colorosa says. She says, if kids come to us from strong, healthy, functioning families, it makes our job easier. If they do not, it makes our job more important. Again, how do you view yourself? Do you view yourself as a difference maker? Someone who can shift that fulcrum. Somebody who can move it so that we tilt more towards the positive than the negative. Look, here's the good news. Most of what you do works for most of the kids. We'll call that plan A. But we got some kids for whom plan B or plan C might have to come into play. And bless their hearts, 254 day kid might be plan R or S or T. Right? Good thing the alphabet has 25 more letters. We have the potential. So what about parents? Again, I know we've got some parents jumping on with us. Some things we need to make sure we are authentically wanting to involve our parents. Right? Found this fascinating. The best predictor of student success in school is the extent to which parents and families encourage and support learning at home and get involved. We know we need to have parents engaged. Right? Connection between engagement and academic achievement. The sooner we have that, the more effective they are in increasing student performance. The earlier they engage, the more committed parents remain. By the way, this isn't just an elementary school thing, not just a primary school thing. We want to keep them engaged all the way through. I came across this very early in my career, Pauline Goff. Educating the child without the support and encouragement of the home is akin to raking leaves in a high wind. You ever have that day where you think, wow, I am making awesome progress with the leaf ranking. Even though it's windy, I think I've done a super job. And then you turn around and it turns out maybe you haven't done such a great job after all. So, you know, when you think about the relationship with parents, particularly those who are in schools, these questions are critical. Why is it important? What are some ways you think we can? Why would some parents who have a child experiencing challenges be reluctant? And how do we authentically build trust while addressing the needs of students and families? We also need to get the difference between engagement and involvement. Right? When it's just involvement, it's our agenda. We own it at the school. It's top down. It's one way. It's basically built on our knowledge. It's about fundraising and advocacy. When we have engagement, right? it's side by side. It's back and forth. It's shared power. It's tapping into the knowledge of our parents, not just relying on our own. And it's about teaching and learning. Look, when we see that higher level of engaged parents, we see the outcomes for kids, right? Higher graduation rates, self-confidence, motivation, better social skills, improved classroom behavior, less likely to have low self-esteem, need to be redirected, need or, and the development of behavioral issues. Less likely to see those. So some strategies, and again, you're going to get this recording, so you'll be able to make notes on all of this. But I always found it was important to reach out at the beginning of the year and then continue to authentically reach out. Right? Contact information. I need to be able to go on your website and find out who the school leader is. I shouldn't have to start to hunt and peck and look all over the place to try and find that. What opportunities do you have for parents to connect? 
Are parents aware of your goals, your expectations? I had an open house policy. You know, you could come in on Fridays. We'd have coffee and conversation. Initiatives presented by parents that support the work of the school community. We had parents want to give out awards that were not your typical awards, but were awards that acknowledged growth, acknowledged positive contributions kids made beyond the academic realm. And they went to work and organized and coordinated all of it. Certainly was in line with what we believed as a school, but they took it on. We supported it. Want to do also, sorry, let me just go back to this one clip here on implicit bias. Okay. Implicit bias has become an issue, has always been an issue. Similar to trauma, not new, but maybe our awareness is increasing. So this clip really highlights for me what we need to keep as our sensitivity and awareness. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? <clears throat> implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of Black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that Black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing. If you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's the scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. Again, yeah, just it's the awareness piece more than anything else that will help us to process through. Implicit. Right? Sometimes, you know, again, beyond our control, potentially. But if we are tired, if we're stressed, if we're distracted, we can fall easier to the implicit bias, as you just saw in that clip. Or are tired on autopilot if we only have certain levels of knowledge about. Look, the world of social media has really kind of thrown this a little off kilter. There are far too many people who are confusing search with research. Those are not the same things. There's a lack of feedback that maybe holds us accountable. I wanted to finish off and then before we turn to questions, also just have a very quick sort of run through on self-care. I'm going to suggest that most of you taking part in this, this might not be something that's a considered a strength of yours, right? I know in the education scene, we're terrible at this because we keep confusing self-care with selfish. But there's a reason why they tell you on the plane to put your own mask on first, right? If you stop breathing, you can't help anybody else. It can't be and continue to be at the bottom of your to-do list. 
it's got to be thought of as health care. I'm also happy that we are at a point in our lives where our own mental health and wellness is no longer just talked about quietly, privately, in hushed whispers, that we're now able to confront some of this and deal with it effectively. So what are sort of the things? Because the last thing I want to do is give you a self-care reminder that ends up being a stressor for you. Oh boy, I better take care of my husband. Oh man, I'm not taking care. I don't need the tension created for you. But what are some things that you might do? Look at this list. If there's some things you're not doing well on this, take the challenge. Pick one thing and work to improve it next week. Improve is just that. If you look at that, you say, wow, enough sleep. Man, I don't think I got it one day last week. Then aim for one day next week. Right? Proper work-life balance, getting health, exercising, enjoying a hobby. Pick something that you're willing to work on. I love this list from Forced. Right? People say to me, well, I, can't, I don't know where to begin. Look, she's got some five minute or less. Hour or less, longer than an hour. So what might be some things that you can take on? Maybe it's something you start drinking water. I found that that's been a huge improvement for me to make sure I have my eight glasses of water a day. And I know the difference when I don't get enough water. I do find myself more irritable. Okay. Everything we talk about around trauma, around stress, around fostering connections, building relationships, equally applies to you, the adults. Are you working in a place that seems both brave and, and safe for you? Do you feel like you are supported, that you are cared for? Because if we don't create that environment, as I said, it's not just about the struggles our kids are having, returning to a world where maybe pandemic isn't the first thing they think about. It's equally that our adults are struggling with some of this. Got to remember to fill your own cup first. What are some things that bring you joy? Something you're grateful for? Something new you're going to learn? These are the things of which we build our own healthy self-care approach. Right? People say to me, yeah, I don't, right? I don't know what to, well, there's a bunch of different ideas. Do you take time to give yourself a break, to decompress? Do you exercise grace for self? You're really good at exercising it for others. Right? Do you have a self-care emergency pack? Right? Maybe there's a snack bar in there or something else. Maybe you just need a fidget ball, something that'll allow you to start to become aware of what the triggers are for you. And then finally, social support. Do you have a network? People you can talk to, not just during times of stress, but always. Somebody you can reach out to, some people. Right? I love this Winnie the Pooh. What's the bravest thing you ever said? Asked Piglet. Help, said Pooh. It's okay. So as we wrap up our timing and get ready to add, answer some of your questions, there's five things I wanted to close up with. Number one, work together. A strong, committed team overcomes challenges. A loose affiliation of individual talent never can. If you are willing to collaborate, one of two things is happening. You're either getting better or you're helping somebody else to get better. Number two, keep a routine. Research is clear. Routines play an important role in mental health. Heard from many, many friends, colleagues, particularly during the hardest moments of the pandemic, that it was the routines that helped keep them grounded. Keep talking. Do you have a buddy system? Regular check-ins with people. If you're part of a trauma-sensitive school, a trauma-sensitive community, a trauma-sensitive business, you have an open environment. We are able to lean on each other. That's the strength of a team. During the hardest moments, members of a team turn to each other, look each other in the eye, and say, we got this. Remember the students, particularly those of you in schools, Right? The reason you got into this was to be a difference maker, not to be a chronicler of what is, but to be a shaper of what can be. 
And then finally, again, put your own mask on first. Self-care can't be at the bottom of your to-do list. We've got to take time for self. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. It's one of my favorites. Do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. I'm hoping our time together, I'm hoping any subsequent conversations I have with any of you contribute to your no that will allow you then to do. As we wrap up, I just have one more clip I want to show you. And this is a reminder that day by day, minute by minute, we get to notice what we choose to notice. I have a lot of memories from when I was a child. One that's always stuck out to me, though, was when I was about 10 years old and I was in school and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen, focus, and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And to be honest, I would sit there and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. Mm. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. <clears throat> and he said to me, hey, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. So I did. I went back to class and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this. I sat on my hands mm. and that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me and he yelled. Yeah. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is it, I am done. Mm. Now I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me and I will never forget it. So I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and I'm at the classroom. He walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I'm going to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, no, I need you to know something, you're not in trouble. But I do have just one question that I have to ask you. He said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and then he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, hey, Clint, you're not a problem. That moment on, I never put those six recorded and played drums all over the world. My whole college education was paid for with drums based in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time when somebody believed in me, he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. From that moment, I learned that there's a difference between being the best in the world and being the best for the world. Again, day by day, minute by minute, we're afforded many opportunities to notice what we want to notice and to respond in a way we get to choose each time. You always get to choose your response. Right? So as we wrap up our time here, I want you to be thinking about the impact of trauma. I want you to be thinking about some of the practices you might engage in to become more trauma sensitive, more trauma aware, or move along that continuum. Anything I can do to help you on this journey, please don't hesitate to reach out. As I said at the outset, uh, Gmail tends to work the quickest. I try to get back to people within 24 hours. 